It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio. Flavored with a dash of humor. Welcome to intelligent, irreverent talk about plants and the planet they grow on. Your questions, comments, and participation are always welcome on Facebook and Instagram at The Mike Novak Show and at Mike Now on Twitter. Good planets are hard to find. Temperate zones and tropic climes. And true currents and thriving seas. Wind blowing through breathing trees. Strong ozone and safe sunshine. Well, good planets are hard to find. Good planets are in the main. Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Jet streams, perfect air. And here they are, Peggy Malecki and Mike Nova. Good planets are in the main right. I'm uh, looking at uh, Legata there in the photo that we have at the, uh, uh-huh. for those of you listening to the podcast, we, we have photos of Legata the cat and Basil the dog. Um, and I was wondering whether I needed Legata cam and I don't know. She... Is she down there <laughs> hanging around? No, no. She, she Not wants... Not sitting on your feet this week. Wants nothing to do with this this week. Okay. Ah. Oh, well, that's uh, that's showbiz. Sometimes you're... Smart cat. <laughs> the very smart cat. She, she's... But she's yeah. going to miss a really good show, though. Oh, my goodness. She is. She would learn so much today. I'm telling you, Gata, you want to be here. But, well, but she can listen to it uh, upstairs with Kathleen because Kathleen is uh, staffing the, mm-hmm. uh, the used tubes. Uh, up there and by the way Kathleen if you're interested you're you're welcome to uh, uh, get on the Twitter machine too um, I don't know if she's because half the time Kathleen gets this up and rolling on our website uh, and and uh, folks you can always watch it at MikeNovak.net, um, but you can also watch it on YouTubes and don't forget to uh, click the button and uh, subscribe to uh, the and used- like and, and right. Well, you know what? At this point, I'll take a subscription. A like would be, it's like gravy. That's, that would be fun. Um, but I know how. Okay. Well, look. What? I'm going to throw another one out there then. Okay. So we're asking everybody who's listening, please make sure you you go to the Mike Novak show on YouTube and subscribe and like. Right. Make sure you're liking us on Facebook. Okay. Make sure you're liking us on Instagram. Okay. And please go to Apple Podcasts like us download and leave some comments there you go yeah if you if you like podcasts and you like to listen to podcasts uh although i would imagine people who are watching the stream are not necessarily listening to the podcast but at any rate no, uh but, but they but, can go to apple podcasts and subscribe that's true. and like and that's true rate us even and, if you don't yeah so uh welcome folks boy uh, i'm very excited today because we have uh on this very gloomy day oh my goodness it i don't know if it's like that up your way, Peggy. But oh yeah, that's why I have yellow on today. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's yeah, I'm right. We need something to brighten. I just <laughs> I just have a little lavender, okay. Uh, but um, on this very gloomy Sunday morning, uh, we have Doug Karen on the show. The return of the butterfly whisperer. Um, I'm so happy to have him with us, and um, we will get to him in in just a second. Um, and as I was saying, Kathleen, uh, if you want to get on the Twitter machine um, and help us out, that that would be great too. Because uh, um, I have no idea what to do with the Twitter machine. Uh, I, I I put my one tweet of the week up right before the show started. And that's <laughs> one tweet a week, whether you need to or not. Okay. Uh, <laughs> now on the Mike Novak show, yeah. yes, that one. <laughs> and today we're talking we're talking insects, we're talking bugs, if you will. Um, we, we, maybe we'll have Doug explain what the difference between insects and bugs are because bugs is actually a real term, scientific term, but I sometimes use it in general, um, Mm -hmm. uh, to, to mean anything, little critters of, of all kinds. Or or we say someone's bugging you, but we don't say they're insecting you. Um, no, you're right. We, we, we don't do that. And uh, you maybe, uh, maybe somebody's got the background on that. One of our listeners. And there you go, Peggy. Uh, 
And uh, uh, so that's the first part of the show. In the second part of the show, obviously, we've got meteorologist Rick DeMaio, but uh, Peggy and I will be talking about uh, a few things uh, that are going on um, in the world of uh, local food and, and piping plovers, because there's piping plover news from the shores of Lake Michigan on Montrose Beach, um, and we will have that information. Uh, we're going to talk about a farm that um, talk about climate change, talk about uh, going from uh, zero to 60, going from drought to flooding. Uh, this farm got wiped out um, uh, last week by the massive rains, and um, they're a chemical-free farm, and uh, they're, they're south in uh, Illinois, and boom, six feet of water. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a photo, and I, and I, I should have... Uh, copied it maybe if I have a chance to manipulate things here before we get there of them in their uh, in a boat and you can see the tops of the tomato I'll, plants I'll try to email it it's, to you oh if you've got that yeah if you've got that I can, no, I can I'll, I'll I'll download at some point when when Doug's occupying the screen I will download it and ah there we go you. all right and speaking of Doug <laughs> occupying the screen we should probably bring in uh, our guest today and that is the aforementioned uh, Doug Terran, uh, PhD, Chief Curator of the Chicago Academy of Sciences. Uh, most of you know the Academy of Sciences uh, by its other name, Peggy Notabart Nature Museum, or it's the Academy of Sciences at Peggy Notabart Nature Museum. Would that be right, Doug? Yeah. yeah. And uh, he's also director of the Illinois Butterfly Monitoring Network. Um, he's the Butterfly Whisperer. This is your new official title, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> uh good morning doug uh you know what i realized is last year we had you on the show i was i was looking as i was putting my blog post together i was looking at that and i realized we gave you all of 12 minutes last time oh You're, boy i know this is this, this is as i said the tyranny of radio and radio what they call radio clocks and where you have to hit a break at you know and we that's i can't believe we only gave you 12 minutes so we're making up for that today all right you get to uh talk a lot longer and we hope you will because you have a lot to talk about this year don't you can can you hear me doug yeah uh you froze briefly there oh my goodness okay sorry about that um let's hope you don't um yeah. well tell me uh to start what is the difference you're seeing, um, not necessarily in insects, but in your work uh, coming out of a, a pandemic year? What was it like to be in a pandemic year, uh, being out in the field, being in the lab or not in the lab? And what is happening this year as we reopen? Yeah, um one of the things that we did differently this past year was um, we usually do our conservation breeding work in uh, the conservation lab at the uh, Peggy Notabart Nature Museum. And um, the museum was closed for much of the pandemic. And so I was uh, reading, rearing Baltimore checker spot caterpillars on my porch. <laughs> and that is, that is unfortunate because um, a porch is a much less controlled environment than laboratory. And so I did not have very good survival over the winter on the porch, unfortunately. Mm. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, and that is, that's, uh, do you do that uh, every year with the Baltimore checker spots? Um, we work with different species in different years. We've been working with the Baltimore checker spots for about five years now. And um, um, we'll probably work with them uh, again in the coming year. But uh, there are other species that we have worked with in the past. And um, some of those we will probably continue working with again. So is uh, the lab opened up now so you can get back to doing yes. things the way uh, you did? Uh, and, and the museum just opened up a couple of days ago, didn't it? Museum reopened on Thursday. We're very, very excited about that. Um, mm -hmm. It's wonderful not only to see people coming back into the museum, but um, we spent an entire year without any butterflies in the butterfly exhibit. And so uh, wow. it's been really good getting, uh, you know, working with our suppliers again and getting butterflies back into the museum. I'm glad you said that and, because, and, oh, go ahead, Peggy. I was going to ask how many 
types of butterflies are in that exhibit. I recall seeing such a huge variety. Yeah, and it varies with time. It's usually about uh, 30 to 60 species at any time. Uh, we're just ramping up again with, uh, with the butterflies, so uh, it's probably on the lower end of that at the moment. Okay. But um, it's really nice to see stuff flying around in there again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I was going to, and, and it's something that had not occurred to me until you brought it up just now, is uh, butterfly suppliers. Where where do you where does what where does one find butterfly suppliers? Yeah, we're we're working with butterfly farms all over the world. So we get butterflies from let's see, Ecuador, Colombia, Costa Rica, mm -hmm. Malaysia. Um, we work with some uh, brokers, but I particularly like working directly with the farmers. Uh, a lot of these are women-owned businesses, which I think is really cool. Um, our Colombian uh, supplier, for example, is a mother and daughter team who live outside of Cartagena, and that's where uh, that's where they farm. And um, uh, the other nice thing about working with the farmers is um, it's um, such a sustainable activity. Um, a number of years ago, I was visiting a butterfly farm in Costa Rica, and it was um, it was a family operation. It was an uh, extended family all participating in the farming, and they showed us where they were growing the host plants, and they showed us the shade houses where they would rear the butterflies, and then they said, "Now we'd like to take you to our other agricultural field," and we walked about a quarter of a mile down the road, and there is a big block of rainforest, and it hmm. is more economically viable for them to keep that as rainforest. And they go in and take small numbers of female butterflies to um, bring into their shade houses and start breeding them. And it's more economical to keep it as that than to turn it into a coffee or a pineapple plantation. Wow, that's, that's encouraging. Do you have to worry um, about breeders and getting diseases uh, coming in with butterflies? I, I, in, in the United States, uh, when we talk about monarchs, uh, there's been a concern over the last few years about mass breeding of, of monarch butterflies. And, and most people now say it's okay if you breed, you know, a handful, if you breed a few, uh, but don't turn it into a factory. Um, do you have to worry about that from your suppliers? Uh, in fact, we do. And not only do we have to worry about that, the Department of Agriculture has to worry about that. Uh. They're, they're our regulatory agency. And there is a whole list of things that we have to do to properly uh, display butterflies. We get uh, inspected periodically and they want to make sure everything is uh, as it should be. Uh, there's a lot of uh, protocols and uh, physical stuff in place to prevent escape. And we need to worry not only about butterflies, um, some of the chrysalises that we get do not have a uh, developing butterfly inside. They have developing parasitic flies or wasps. Yikes. And, um, yeah, and uh, they don't want those escaping either. You know, mm -hmm. anything that could, could change the current balance yeah. of what we've got here. So um, it, is yeah, it, we, go, go ahead, Doc. We, we had a really, really parasitized chrysalis uh, um, just come in this week. You, you could tell, and I broke it open, and it was like a little burrito filled with these fly larvae. Wow. Wow. Mm. That's, that's, so do you have a, a, a holding area before they go into the general population at the museum? We do. We've got, uh, if you go into Butterfly Haven, you'll see there's a little lab kind of tucked into the back mm -hmm. of the exhibit. And um, there's a window in it so visitors can see into the lab and see yeah. what's they going on. Yeah, have, have them hanging there. Yeah, well, that's that's where we, the, um, the chrysalises come just in, in regular shipping boxes. Mm -hmm. And that's where we open the boxes, hang them up on those racks, and then... Um, as the adult, adults emerge, we transfer them into cages and um, uh, bring them in and release them in uh, the exhibit. That's and amazing. We're doing, we're doing two yeah. uh, release events a day for the public, which seems to be a popular activity. And then you just walk, I don't know if you've been there, Mike, you walk through the exhibit and there's just butterflies everywhere surrounding you. 
you know what? I I have seen it from the outside. I haven't actually been in the exhibit, so now it's time for me to get there mm-hmm. and and do that. Um, and uh, I see it now. I learned a lot just now uh, that I, about stuff that hadn't even occurred to me about how you careful you have to be when you're bringing these things uh, in. Um, okay, well, let's get to some of the specifics. I, I, where should we start? Should we start with regal fritillaries? Because uh, you were out looking at regal fritillaries the other day. I actually have some photos that you sent along. Tell us about your expedition. Well, this was uh, an expedition that um, the uh, Illinois Nature Preserves Commission and Department of Natural Resources were running. Uh, It was Mm -hmm. in Pembroke Township, which is in far east central Illinois, uh, the area east of Kankakee. And uh, the picture you've got up now is the area where uh, where my team found most of the regals. We divided into three teams, and each team had about five people in it. And we would stand in a straight line separated by about 15 feet between people. And we would, in unison, walk across the field and count the number of regal fritillaries that we were seeing. I, it never occurred to me, and again, I'm, I'm kind of an idiot when it comes to these things, uh, that you would do it in such a regimented way. It's, what, is, what is the science behind marching in a line like that? Well, um, this is, um, it's not a widely used technique, um, I think mostly because um, it's hard to get that many people out on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. But the idea is you're covering blocks of area and you're walking over, uh, you, you know, you're creating like this square block of area as you walk. And um, you can then go through each area once. And this technique does not give you an actual population size. Um, it gives you like a relative abundance. And so you compare uh, the abundance that you see from year to year. And you said uh, in an, I, on your Facebook post that there were tons of them there when, uh, on the other, the other day when you were out there. It was a good year. And um, we... Um, uh, on my team, we saw about 70 of them over two hours, um, wow. which, is, which is pretty good. Yeah, um, we went to three sites. Not all of the sites were equally good. Um, the, the site you showed the picture of had the most. Uh, one of the other teams uh, saw, uh, were reporting comparable numbers on completely different sites to what we had seen. And uh, I don't know what the third team got yet. Okay, Peggy, mm-hmm. uh, you're raising your hand. So I was going to ask for listeners who might not be familiar with the regal fritillary butterfly, what is the significance of these numbers in Illinois? Regal fritillary is a threatened species in Illinois. And uh, regal fritillaries originally, their range extended from extreme eastern Colorado and Wyoming, east to the Atlantic coast, and uh, in the east, they would extend from the Carolinas on up to the Maritimes. And they've done particularly badly east of the Mississippi River. There are some populations left in uh, Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin. There is a single population in Pennsylvania and a single population in Virginia. Those two isolated po- eastern populations are both on military reservations. Mm-hmm. And uh, the good news is it seems to be staging something of a comeback here in um, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Indiana. The numbers are increasing, and it's popping up on some new sites, so that's very exciting. And is that uh, butterfly weed that we're seeing uh, Mm -hmm. the fritillary on there? Yes. Okay. Um, They they love the various species of milkweed, although they will take nectar from a bunch of other flower types as well. Um, and what I, one of the things I wanted to ask you, uh, and I want to go back to uh, the, the photo here. All right, let's go back to this. The, the, area, the areas that you uh, went searching in, uh, are they remnant prairie or are they just land that's been naturalized again? Uh, can you describe th- those lands? Uh, They're remnant prairie, but they're not real super high quality prairie in some cases. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, The 
the regals seem to be able to tolerate uh, a degree of having their habitat beat up as long as they've got host plant. And the caterpillars feed exclusively on various species of violets. And that's one of the reasons that regals have been resistant to restoration because uh, violets tend to be underrepresented on a lot of restoration projects. It's hard to go out and gather violet seed. It's not like um, some of the more typical plants like lead plant or Indian grass or something like that where you can go out and just get gobs and gobs of seed at the end of the year. Violets, um, you know, by the time the seed is ripe, they're buried in the vegetation. The seed doesn't hang on the plants very well because the seed capsule explodes shortly after it's ripe. And uh, so they've not been included in restorations as readily as um, a lot of the other things that we think of as prairie plants. Now, that's interesting because for the average homeowner, they're right now cursing the screen and saying, I wish I could get rid of some of those violets in, in my yard. And I had a friend write to me um, a couple of months ago and said, how do I get rid of violets? And I said, why do you want to get rid of violets? You really want to keep it, <laughs> the violets, because... Um, they support fritillaries. Now, the fritillaries we see in our backyards are not likely to be regal fritillaries, correct? Right. right. We see great spangled fritillaries. And oh. great spangled fritillaries are really a savanna species. And a lot of organisms um, sort of um, uh, treat suburbs and suburban um, housing neighborhoods as though they were savannas. So the savanna species hmm. uh, in those neighborhoods are doing a little better than the prairie and grassland species. That's a, uh, I just realized that's a, a, a good exclamation to use. Great spangled fritillary. Uh, so the next time. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. <laughs> 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 Look at that. Well, great spangled fritillary. That's the best great spangled fritillary I've ever seen. Um, anyway, uh, oh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's uh, there. There's a reason to keep violets around. What I found uh, with uh, about violets in the yard is just do a little patch at a time and leave some. Figure out where you don't want them. Dig them up there. That's pretty much my front lawn. Yeah. <laughs> Under yeah. the tree. Under yeah. the tree, that's all it grows. <laughs> so uh, for folks who do have uh, violets in their uh, lawn and in their, their garden and they want to protect uh, fritillaries, what, what is the life cycle and how should they be paying attention to it? Yeah. Um, first of all, you're probably not going to see the caterpillars because they feed nocturnally. So, um, you know, if you're out gardening in the afternoon, they're all hunkered down in the, in the weeds. Um, fritillaries have sort of a bizarre life cycle. Um, the regals are a good example. They've been flying for about a month now. And when we were um, uh, in Pembroke Township this week, we were actually seeing way more females than we were males. And mm -hmm. that's kind of normal for this time of year. What's been happening over the last month is that the butterflies have been, they've emerged from their chrysalises, they've been flying around and mating, but the females haven't been laying eggs. And what starts to happen about at this time of the year is that the females will start briefly at first and then for longer periods of time going into little thickets of brush out on the prairie and roosting in the thickets. And by the end of July, they are going to go and do that and kind of hunker down for most of the month of August. And then uh, they will start emerging again generally around the last week of August, and that's when they start laying eggs. And the eggs hatch sometime in September. The caterpillars hatch out of the eggs, eat the eggshell, and then immediately go into their winter hibernation. So you've got this tiny, tiny one millimeter caterpillar, and that's what's going to survive the Chicago winter. Wow. And in the spring, they will break diapause. They will come out of hibernation right about the time the violets are greening up. And they will feed on the violets and uh, pupate sometime in May and complete the life cycle by emerging from their chrysalises in June. And it works pretty much the same way for um, the other big fritillaries, the great spangleds, um, uh, the aphrodites, those sorts of species. 
Yeah. Um, so where where are the eggs overwintering? Uh, in the gr- on the ground, uh, 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 sheltered under a leaf? Uh, where? Uh, they, they, the caterpillars just seem to crawl down into the leaf litter and winter there. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that that does is this does make uh, fritillary susceptible to fire. And this mm-hmm. is this is part of the challenge for people who are doing burn management is burning enough that you're maintaining the prairie because fire is essential for that, but not burning so much that you are wiping out all of the um, uh, populations of fritillaries and other things that are wintering in the leaf litter. Like uh, fireflies. Like fireflies, yes. Uh, all right. So, uh, in fact, let's make that a transition here. I mean, everybody thinks we're going to go right to the monarchs. No, we're going to put the monarchs. On. We're, we're going to talk other insects right now. Um, uh, we're would... going to shine the light on the fireflies. It, but, there you go. All right. <laughs> Um, what Sorry. kind of a, uh, and we'll use this as a jumping off point for fireflies too. What kind of a fritillary year would you say it, it is in Illinois right now? Um, what kind of a firefly year? No, is no. It? Fritillary. What kind of a fritillary year? Um, it's a pretty good fritillary year. Uh, I've been seeing, uh, great spangles on my, um, uh, butterfly root at, at Bluff Spring Fen in pretty good numbers. We definitely saw good numbers of regals down by Kankakee. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Okay, then so let's uh, make that transition now to fireflies. What kind of a firefly year are we having? Because I will say I don't, I haven't seen that many. I've seen some in my yard, um, but I wouldn't say that it's been in uh, terrific numbers uh, so far. And I, yeah, that's I've been my experience. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've seen more than the last few years, but not, you know, massive light show, but um and and could that change uh, how how are fireflies uh well, and and other flying insects, uh butterflies affected by this uh dry spring we had and then recent rains uh is that messing with them uh last year you said the fireflies were having a fantastic year and you attributed that to a a wet spring yes and i will make the analogous attribution for this spring um fireflies in particular the larvae are going to be negatively affected by drought Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons they will be negatively affected by drought is because of what the firefly larvae eat. Um, the larvae are carnivorous, <clears throat> and they will eat little um, uh, roly polies and it's earthworms and small snails and uh, you know things that like damp vegetation. And so their prey base has not really had a great year, and consequently they haven't. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I have a question that I, I meant to ask you last year and uh, forgot. Uh, I like to leave my leaf litter, leave the leaves, as, as a lot of people mm-hmm. say. Uh, I don't rake it um, much at all. It, it Maybe off the little tiny bit of lawn that I have there, but otherwise I just leave it <coughs> in the garden all year round. Um, is that going to make a difference in my own backyard if I see fireflies or is the firefly population for the whole area the, in general? I mean, how much difference does it make if I'm doing that in my own tiny plot? And nobody else is. It, you know. It'll make a little bit of difference. Um, I mean, you'll notice more difference if all your neighbors are doing the same thing as well. Yeah. But, um, you know, I do notice... Um, more fireflies in uh, my neighborhood in um, areas where they're a little bit less manicured. Um, and that's that's why we tend to have a bunch in my yard every year, which is a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, but, you know, some, some of my neighbors take a similar approach, and I see the same sort of thing mm-hmm. there. Yeah, and I've got on one side – uh, more like me, uh, although nobody's like me. Okay, my my yards, uh, uh, you know, I had uh, <laughs> the your yards an oasis on the, your block. The, the little guy next door poked his head in one day and went, "It's a jungle in there." And I said, "Yeah, well, <laughs> sometimes it does get out of control." So there's there's it's dark, and I try to keep the lights off, and I have the leaf litter, and I have lots of things growing. Uh, but on one side, I've got the uh, the neatness freak 
who's just like mowing everything down to and just raking everything up and everything's gone. Get it out of there. So this is uh, you deal with what you deal with uh, in your neighborhood. Uh, that's Doug Terran, a PhD chief curator at the Chicago Academy of Sciences. We are talking um, about bugs. Uh, and the difference between bugs and insects, uh, Doug, is? Um, bugs are a particular order of insects, hemiptera. Some people will call them the true bugs. I think people are familiar with stink bugs, which is kind of the uh, classic illustration of hemiptera. Uh, the milkweed bugs, the red and orange bugs that you see on milkweeds are, are bugs. Mm -hmm. uh, when, I, when I was young, a lot of the entomology community would be very sort of pointing their finger at you, don't say bugs if you mean insects. And <laughs> I, people, have, people have loosened up a lot about that, which I think is a good thing. Yeah. I, I think, um, uh, you know, referring to insects in general as bugs, I think uh, does a lot among other things to kind of make them more accessible to people and yep. um, make people feel better about them, which I think is always a good thing. All right. Well, we're going to talk more bugs and slash insects. Uh, when we come back, it's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. We hope you stick around. You can help slow climate change in 2021 by composting. And you don't even need a backyard. By composting communally in multi-unit buildings across Chicagoland, Collective Resource Compost has diverted 7,000 tons of food scraps since 2010. CRC brings you a fresh 5-gallon bucket or a 32-gallon neighbor tote with each pickup. You fill it with organic matter, they swap it out, and get it to a commercial composting operation. Fight climate change. Go to collectiveresource.us. time to win our hearts all in let's let the fun begin take a dive take a dive take a dive i see you cloud and i see you cloud and i see you cloud and i Whether you're a farmer or a backyard gardener, assist your soil in providing key nutrients to your plants with Spectrum Soil Inoculum from Tinyo Biologicals. The beneficial microorganisms in Spectrum break down and release vital nutrients and make them more accessible to your plants. Spectrum works with nature to decompose organic matter into humus, building richer, healthier soil. Spectrum is approved for use on certified organic crops and is OMRI listed. Get Spectrum at blazing-star.com. And welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. You know, just before the break, uh, and by the way, that's Doug Terran, uh, Ph.D. from uh, the Peggy Notabart Nature Museum. And uh, we're talking insects. We're talking flying things. Uh, speaking of flying things, um, I showed you uh, a video. Last year, I, I sent you a video, and I said, would you identify this hummingbird moth? I knew it was a hummingbird moth, and I couldn't figure out the exact species, and you said it was a Nessus sphinx moth, which is really hard to say. Um, but uh, this year I had another critter uh, on my milkweed. I said, oh, this is re really interesting, and I'm going to play that for you uh, right now so you can see what I was talking about, and I didn't know what it was. And you had some pretty bad news for me there, Doug. Do you want to tell me what this is? <laughs> This is a squash vine borer. <laughs> this is what's going to kill all of the uh, zucchinis and uh, summer squashes uh, in uh, in your vegetable garden. <laughs> oh, lordy, lordy, lordy! Uh, I, and, and and I'm going to show it one more time. Uh, so those of you, those of you, <laughs> might see it in your own yard can identify it. Uh, I figured it was some kind of milkweed bug because of the orange and black, which is sort of traditional for those those insects um 
Go ahead. Yeah, squash, borer, squash borers are in a moth family called Ciciidae. They're often called the wasp moths. And many of the species in that family mimic stinging insects. And so they've got the warning coloration on them. Mm -hmm. And this one is no exception. Yeah, it looks like a wasp. I, I thought it yeah. might be some kind of wasp. Uh, and uh, you'd think that... Uh, as long as I've been gardening in the backyard, I would have known what a squash vine bore adult looks like by now, but I did not. Um, but this one caught your attention. Uh, yeah, well, there it was. It was oh, look it. It's yeah. so pretty. Let me get, get the camera on. Oh, it's on the milkweed. Yay. <laughs> that's how sometimes we, but that's where we start making the connection sometimes. When you get that, you know, we're looking at the flower or the whatever, and suddenly this insect comes in that we may have seen before, but we're making that connection with the flower. So I have to give the advice. I mean, I didn't take my own advice, but I, I knew I was taking a chance. You're always taking a chance if you plant uh, squash vines early in the season. Uh, and I have a couple there. I have some cucumbers, too. From, but what, from what I've read, they probably won't bother the cucumbers. Um, but you never know. It's, it's a possibility. But they're more likely to go after my zucchini plants that are there. Um, and uh, my buddy Dan Costa, who watches the show, I, I you know, I haven't even looked at the, at the comments so far. Yeah, we, I haven't seen haven't seen Dan up there this morning. Yeah, um, but he told me years ago. He said, "Here's my rule of thumb: uh, don't plant squash before the Fourth of July." Um, and why would he say that, Doug? Uh, because the um, um, by the, if you plant squash now, by the time it germinates the uh, adult moths are going to have stopped flying and won't be laying eggs on it. So they've got, uh, in this part of the country, they seem to have a single generation a little bit earlier in the summer. Mm -hmm. Ah, so uh, you, can, you can avoid that uh, and, and get your squash. You're going to have later, you're not going to get the early squashes, um, but uh, you will avoid the squash vine board. Now, that said, I'm keeping an eye on my squash plants <laughs> and just, you know, it is possible to remove a squash vine borer mm -hmm. once it, yeah. it has burrowed into the, and they burrow into the stems of, of your squash plants and, um, and it cuts off the circulation and the plant wilts and dies. Uh, what you can do is you can take a razor or uh, an X-Acto knife or something. You can slit down the stem until you find that, uh, that, uh, that uh, larva and um, you can remove it. Now, can more than one larva enter a plant, or will, will it just be one? Oh, more than it one. It doesn't have to be just one, yeah. Yikes. Yeah. This, this is also something that, yeah. 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 This is also something that climate change may mess up for us. Further south, mm -hmm. this has more than one generation a year. So wow. we may be limited in how much time we can avoid them by planting after the 4th of July. Oh, my goodness. You know, and that's a, a way, uh, yet yeah, one more way climate change is working mm -hmm. against us um let's talk uh then since we brought up and by the way dan costa is out there he just said i am watching so. i just started a bit late we invoked your name uh, dan um i will be sending you the cash no wait you send me the cash that's how that works um uh, but uh let, let's talk a little bit about about climate change and let's let's get into that conversation about monarchs um you um mentioned uh to uh me earlier that uh what did you say the, the monarchs were were a slow it was a slow start to the monarch season this year yeah okay um and that of course w w well let me ask you what to what do you attribute that um the monarchs um uh Got off to a slow start in Texas this year. The, uh, the numbers were down a bit in Mexico. Um, I wasn't particularly long-term alarmed about the magnitude of this particular year's drop. Uh, however, it's more alarming this particular year's drop placed in the context of how they've been doing recently. So we didn't have as many to start out with. One of the things that we know about the monarch is that they can really... Um, uh, expand their numbers quickly if conditions mm -hmm. are good during the breeding season. And um, it seems to be 
being a, a good start to the July generation at the moment. We're seeing a lot of them. The butterfly monitors are reporting fair numbers. Uh, people anecdotally are noticing um, uh, larger numbers on their survey routes, and they will um, comment on that along with the, uh, the, the data that they're sending in. And so this seems, uh, at least at the moment, to be poised to be a year when the numbers can uh, rebound somewhat. All right, let's. Uh, let's so let's, that's the good news. <laughs> yeah, that's the good news. Let's let's talk about that though for for a second because this is something you've said on our show for several years now that there's um, uh, a train of thought that uh, goes to the, where people look at the numbers coming out of Mexico in February, and that's the de determining factor in whether the monarchs are doing well. And you say, well, no, you really need to look at uh, how the populations do over the summer. Would you explain that? Well, what you really need to do is look at how the populations are doing long term. Um, I think my main complaint about how the numbers in Mexico are reported, if you look at those graphs that they have of annual numbers, either in Mexico or in uh, Illinois or uh, up here in the north, they jump around a lot from year to year. And so there can be things that happen in the winter that will sound like really enormous, scary declines. Mm -hmm. And they're well within the normal range of bouncing around. So it's not a single year over year variation in either direction that's going to mean anything. We've had a couple of years lately where we've had big spikes up. And, you know, there's been a 146% increase in the number of wintering monarchs. That doesn't really mean anything either. These are numbers that you have to look in the context of a lar larger time frame. Okay. And... Um we have a, a question here from uh, one of our viewers. Um, it's our friend Deb who says, uh, I have a friend who seeks out monarch eggs and brings them into a special enclosure in order to protect them from predators. Is this wise or is it better to just leave them be and let nature take its course? And uh, from what I understand, it's a very small percentage of, uh, of caterpillars that make it to the adult stage. Yeah. yeah, and that's true for uh, just about any insects. It's, it, um, it drives the reproductive strategy. Insects lay large numbers of eggs. The regal fritillaries that we were talking about earlier, we have reared them in the laboratory before and gotten over a thousand eggs from a single female. And wow. this is the sort of thing, this is the sort of thing that you do when most of these offspring are going to die before they reach adulthood. Mm. Um, in terms of bringing eggs in, there are a couple of things that are happening that are, are potential unintended consequences of doing that. First of all, by bringing stuff in, you're artificially concentrating a lot of caterpillars into a small area. In nature, you'd never see that many monarch caterpillars in one place. And this really... Um, increases the potential for spreading disease. And monarchs have a whole bunch of diseases that are associated with the caterpillars, more than most of the other species that I've worked with. And um, so this, you can then release um, uh, monarchs that are carrying these diseases into the environment, which is a, uh, never a good thing. The other thing that sometimes happens is that um, what you're doing is you are selecting for those caterpillars that do well in captivity. And those adaptive traits may not be the same adaptive traits that are adapted towards survival in the wild. So you're, we're, we're, we are potentially influencing the evolutionary course of the species by taking large numbers into um, uh, your kitchen and re or rearing them on, on the kitchen table. I think the, the current accepted wisdom is this, this is a wonderful educational opportunity for people. And if you uh, limit what you're doing to 10 or 12 caterpillars, that's great. You're not gonna really cause problems by doing that. Um, and, but you'll you'll get to experience watching the monarchs grow and develop, and it's it's a great exercise for kids. Uh, and uh, this uh, one of the things I read recently said um, 
when they get this disease in the wild, it's uh, it usually doesn't do as much harm because they're not going to make it to Mexico. It, uh, it 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 so that's how that's the cleansing uh, effort that nature does for monarchs because those diseased ones will not live to procreate in in Mexico. Um, but uh, we st- we still have to worry about spreading that disease by raising these. Uh, another thing is the um, milkweed, uh, the annual milkweed, which uh, folks in like to grow in Florida and in California. Uh, here in the Midwest, the, the annual milkweed will die over the winter, but in those places it doesn't, and, and there's some problem with that, isn't there? Tropical milkweed. Tropical milkweed, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, the tropical milkweed... Um, it's not just that it doesn't die over the winter. It, uh, it can stay green during the migration period. And mm-hmm. um, when the monarchs are migrating, they're um, in reproductive diapause. It means more or less they are not mating. They are not laying eggs. Uh, however, there is some evidence that encountering uh, fresh green milkweed, um, milkweed that's not, you know, starting to turn yellow already and getting ready to, uh, to die back for the fall can stimulate them to come out of reproductive diapause to a degree, stop migrating and, and um, start laying eggs on that milkweed. And, and I don't think anybody really knows the magnitude of the effect that that's going to have yet, but it's, it's um, certainly a cause for concern. Um, it's, it's a challenging problem because um, there's a lot of tropical milkweed growing in the southern states now, mm. and not all of it is in people's gardens. Yeah, and it's uh, Asclepius uh, carasavica, if that's how you pronounce it, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, that is the one, and it has those, it is a beautiful plant. That's part of the problem. People love it in their yards because it's got the orange and red flowers. Very striking, very striking plant. But you're probably better off getting uh, milkweed from your own neck of the woods, wherever that is in the United States. And there's, you know, I don't know, 70 to 100 different native milkweed species, uh, uh, depending on who you read. And, uh, uh, and it should not be hard for you to find it. Although apparently it is in some places in the West, it's hard to find na- uh, places that will sell native plants, mm-hmm. native milkweed. Uh, one of the other things I read that I was really fascinated by was a, an article, and I put it uh, in uh, my blog post, and folks, you can go to uh, mikenovak.net, um, and uh, it was uh, from the Miami Herald, and... It was, uh, and, it, and it mentioned this tropical milkweed uh, in Florida and th- why Florida is unique for monarchs because apparently some monarchs stay in Florida. Um, they don't make it back or they get sidetracked. Uh, and nobody really knows because um, d- decades ago when we should have been tagging monarchs, nobody was doing it in Florida. So we don't really know if this is a pattern, a trend, if this is something new. Uh, are you familiar with this, Doug? Uh, I, I am. And um, uh, Florida has always been um, less well understood in terms of the, the uh, dynamics of how the migration works there. Uh, there were um, uh, people wondering for a while if they might um, uh, across the Caribbean via Cuba over to the Yucatan. There's no evidence for that at all, but it was uh, a hypothesis at one point. Um, there, uh, there is a close relative of the monarch, the queen butterfly, that is found in Florida that also uses milkweed that is a um, year-round resident there and does not seem to be migratory. So, um, you know, the resources for the species are there and probably have long been there. Um, it's it's part of this whole picture that has not been worked out well yet. Isn't that interesting? I mean, it's, we're we're still trying to figure out um, about monarchs. Um, I, I have to uh, laugh. I, one of the articles I posted there, and, and we'll talk about it in a second, is about the Western population, the Western monarch. Um, yeah. You know, we we discovered. Uh, air quotes, where the monarchs overwinter in the 70s. But as somebody in that article said, oh, the Mexicans knew it all along. They just weren't telling anybody. Um, and that, that, that was smart 
of them really because you <laughs> you don't want folks tramping through there and 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 tourists coming uh, uh, in that area. It's 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 a, a sacred area and it's um, fragile. It's it's very fragile. Um, but let's talk about the the Western monarch population, which has crashed in the last year, um, down to almost nothing. Um, how are they related to Eastern monarchs, and, and and what do you think are the chief causes for that crash? Well, I think they're um, related to the Eastern monarchs more than um, might be anticipated at, uh, at first blush. Um, the um, genetics uh, suspect, uh, suggest that there is um, a non-negligible mixing between the two populations. That's actually good news because it means that um, uh, should conditions improve for the monarchs in the West, um, it's, um, uh, there is some reason to expect that, the, uh, that they would be able to recover spontaneously from that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think that the uh, very long-term drought conditions that have been in, in place in the West and much more serious than what we've been experiencing here um, almost certainly are uh, having a negative effect. Um, I, uh, the, the article that you shared um, mentioned some of the new generation insecticides, and I, I think that um, that certainly cannot be dismissed. Um, I think in particular in light of the fact that the monarch is not the only species that declines are being yeah. reported from lately uh, would cause one to look at something that would have more general effects than something that necessarily is entirely milkweed specific. Yeah, and if I could hop in, one thing in that article did mention as well was talking about how milkweed and garden centers may even have been treated in some cases with some of those herbicides, and well-meaning people are purchasing it and not even knowing that, that the plants have been treated. Yeah, one of the insidious things about the neonicotinoids is that they're often used as systemic herbicides, uh, insecticides, I mean, and, and what they're done, it's a seed treatment. And then as the mm -hmm. plant grows, the insecticide is translocated through the entire plant. And so if you're eating the plant, it doesn't at that point really matter so much what part of the plant that you're eating. It's all going to be bad for you. Yeah. And, and when you add that, as uh, we said earlier, to uh, climate change and habitat loss, uh, now you've got the makings of, um, of trouble. All right, you you got yeah. trouble in trouble in River City, uh, right there. In fact, yeah. I realized we said that before the show. So this is another thing the article says. It 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 lays it out and and basically says there's three things probably the big three at work here are climate change, habitat loss, and pesticide use. And when I say pesticides, I mean herbicides and pesticides and fungicides and oh, yeah, yeah, pretty much uh, across so the board. One of our watchers, uh, Ernest, is up in Portland, and he commented um, that before the heat wave, he had been seeing some monarchs, and since the heat wave, he hasn't seen any. Is this extreme heat or just a normal pattern? I, it's hard to say. At this time of year, the adult monarchs don't have a really long life cycle. Uh, but I know uh, back in 2012, the uh, year that we had the really intense heat here in Illinois, we were seeing a lot of species get hammered by these periods of hot weather. So um, uh, it, it could be either or both of those things going on. And by the way, then, oh, go ahead. Peggy. I was going to say, would, would the monarchs kind of go into a hibernation during the heat or does it just kind of die back at that point? When it gets really hot, you will see a lot of butterflies kind of hunker down during the heat of the day and go into the vegetation. Um, but this is that, uh, you know, they're not foraging at that point. So um, uh, I think uh, it is it is likely that a lot of these species are going to have a shortened lifespan as an adult and won't be laying as many eggs. The thing I was going to add here is so we're talking about uh, uh, selling milkweed. Uh, Dan Costa, who uh, who works uh at uh, a, uh, a greenhouse in Chicago area says 10 or 15 years ago, if you said you could sell milkweed to people, I would have said you were crazy. Now it's hard to keep in stock. And that shows that, that 
people have become aware of that and our and the whole idea of planting milkweed for monarchs is a big deal now yeah and you're really going to do a lot more potentially to help the monarch by planting milkweed than you are by uh, raising caterpillars in your kitchen that's a good point. Uh, it's going to be a much, much more effective conservation measure. Yeah. So if you're going to do anything, plant milkweed. That that's and and other flowers that uh, the the monarchs can feed on as adults. Yeah, I think the other thing that uh, is an important piece of that puzzle is planting things that are going to be good nectar sources that are blooming in late August and early September to support the migration. Uh, at that point, not only are you supporting the monarchs that were born here, you're going to be supporting monarchs that were born up in Wisconsin and UP Michigan and Canada mm -hmm. and Minnesota because they're all they're going to be migrating through. Okay. All right. Before we go... Um uh, we got to get in something about dragonflies because you're also a, a dragonfly <laughs> whisperer, Doug. Uh, tell us, uh, have you been doing anything fun with dragonflies uh, this year? Or what's the population like? Um, I have not gotten to do much myself with dragonflies this year. We've got a bunch of people through the Illinois Odenate survey out counting dragonflies. And... Um, that's um, a lot of fun. We have a lot of people um, at Morton Arboretum. We have a lot of people out at Echusa Grasslands, but there are also people in the forest preserves um, uh, going around and counting dragonflies. And um, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun to be able to start looking at these data longer term and seeing what's happening. Um, we do have some evidence that they are behaving like the butterflies and that their numbers are in... Uh, sort of a long-term decline. Is that, uh, okay, is that a real issue, uh, insect decline? There are some people who say we don't know. Uh, there are others say, oh, yeah, we're, uh, we're, we're losing insects hand over fist like we're losing birds. Uh, what is your observation on that? Uh, there are a whole bunch of papers that have come out. Some of the early ones have been critiqued, and some of the more recent ones have been um, you know, modifying uh, techniques to answer these critiques. And, uh, and really, that's the way science should be working. Uh, I think there is a lot of smoke on this issue for there not to be any fire at the moment. Uh, we're seeing it in, uh, in different parts of the world. We're seeing it with completely different species groups. Um, now, we haven't published anything on the dragonfly numbers, so that's just anecdotal data at this point. But assuming it holds, you've got a group of insects that's very different from butterflies. They're aquatic as um, nymphs. They're carnivorous through their entire life cycle, and yet they're showing the same sort of downward trends. And so these are, are species with very different ecologies that uh, groups, I should say, with very different ecologies mm -hmm. that both um, may be experiencing declines at the moment. That's pretty alarming. Yeah, uh, it is. And uh, remember the big three, folks. And I and and before the show, we were talking. Um, I would put habitat loss at the top of the list, followed by pesticides, followed by climate change. But climate change will catch up very quickly uh, as as we move forward. Uh, before we go, uh, I want to have you give a plug for the Illinois Butterfly Monitoring Network? Oh, the Illinois Butterfly Monitoring Network is wonderful. This is uh, something that a lot of people were able to be involved in through the pandemic, so it was a great way to get out and experience nature. Uh, people get assigned to a survey route, and you go out, and a minimum of six times a year, you walk this survey route at a constant pace, and you're counting and identifying all of the butterflies that you see within 20 feet of yourself. <laughs> uh, you can find out more about it at uh, www.bfly.org. Uh, well, and I've got that link. Uh, up on uh, my blog posts, if folks want to go there, I've also got uh, the link I'm to just the putting it in the feed right now. Too. Okay, great. And also put the uh, Peggy Notabart Nature Museum, which is uh, naturemuseum.org. That's that's pretty easy. And get over there. And I've got to be one of the ones to do that. Get over uh, to the butterfly exhibit now that you're repopulating it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, when do you think it'll be up to full speed? Well, it's almost up to full speed now. Um, we've got a lot of butterflies. A lot of what will happen are things that are a little less noticeable um, 
to the ordinary visitor, we will have more species of butterflies that look similar to each other than we've currently got. Um, but it's, it's pretty spectacular right now. You walk through and um, these sunny days we've been having, the butterflies are just flying all over the place. They're landing <laughs> on the waterfall. They're mm -hmm. landing on the path. They're landing on you sometimes. Uh, it's a lot of fun. That's great. Um, and uh, listen, you must be uh, exhausted right now. I've, you, you, you've given us a lot of information uh, in an hour, and I can't thank you enough for uh, being part of the show. You're such a great friend to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki, and we love having you here and getting the science about insects, bugs, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> Thanks so much. It's always a pleasure to be here. All right, Doug. You Thanks, have a you have, you have a great gloomy Sunday. <laughs> I'm hoping. <laughs> I don't think we're going to see any sun today, but uh, we'll be thinking about insects. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. We will be right back. The best thing about my job is the excitement of uh, waking up every morning, just wondering what the challenges are going to be that day. So, how do you like my office? We lead with safety. It's the first thing that I think about when I wake up. It's the last thing I think about when I go to bed. We've got a number of employees in the office, myself included, who've been, been around for 10, 15 plus years. So people enjoy working for the company. And staff retention is a thing that we're very, very keen on. It's no secret that the world of arboriculture is a male-dominated industry, but there is a fearless group of women out there that are determined to change that, and I'm really proud to be one of those women. At my office, I feel like you could take just about anyone, put a crew together, and send them out to a job and have it be successful. And that has to do with trusting the people you work with, feeling safe around them, and knowing their strengths and weaknesses. One of the proudest moments working uh, with Barlet for me was being the first to do training in a Spanish class. Bartlett is all about promoting from within. We really want to focus on our people and make sure that they're trained, make sure that they understand their role, and you slowly grow through your experience, and then you improve and, and move on to different roles within the company. There's always new positions, even at a base level, myself included. I started off as a climber and I've worked my way through to being local manager in the office. Bartlett has been really great about recognizing any kind of roadblocks for different genders, different races, people of different nationalities, and just kind of taking a bulldozer to all of those roadblocks. Every tree needs a champion. 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 Welcome to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio with just a sip on of humor. Or is that a dash? Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Here they are again, Peggy Malecki and Mike Novak. All I need is good food to eat and make me healthy, wealthy, wide awake. Lettuce, tomatoes, root of bacon. What about those sweet potatoes? All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good tools to make me music, porches, lawn serrate. And welcome back. Welcome, welcome. I, uh, and I got to tell you, it was just so fantastic to have Doug Terran uh, just yeah. Go through all the different insects, uh, which he knows so much about. Um, it's uh, and when I when I saw it, and I, I didn't realize <laughs> we had only given him twelve minutes last wow. time. I said, no, no, that's rude. I, I think I want to say there was something that came up with dragonflies that we had seen. It was like, let's get dug on. Uh, I, I, you I, might I be right. I think you, that's what happened. Why he only had twelve minutes? Yeah. Um, and one thing we didn't even get to is. Um, uh, dragonfly migration i think he was mm -hmm. the one who told us in the past that they dragonflies migrate much in the same way that monarchs yeah. do ex except they don't know where they overwinter yeah. 
which yeah it uh, hasn't been as studied yet so uh the folks of whatever country they're overwintering in are being really smart and not telling us which i think is a is is a really really good thing um we mentioned a few uh stories that we were going to get to I want to find, uh, give me two seconds here, because i got to find the one. Here we go, I think. The flooding? Got... I emailed yeah. you that photo. Yeah, you know what, and I just, I just uh, put it up there. Uh, we heard from Bob Benenson, who uh, does Local Food Forum. You can go to localfoodforum at substack.com uh, to see his reports, and he's... Uh, He's relentless. I mean, he's he gets them out at pretty much every day. I'm I'm just stunned at I don't know how he does it, Peggy. Um, you you know, being a publisher yourself, I'm sure you're just scratching your head. That's just that's nuts. Um, he walks around with a keyboard stuck to his hands. I I think so. Uh, but he writes this week. He I, I saw this come in uh, the mail, the email uh, about a farm in downstate Illinois. Uh, called Cook Farm, um, mm -hmm. and it was a worst-case scenario, as he writes. Uh, I'm yeah. going to read, read some of this. Well, he the says, headline. Even yeah, the headline. Cook Farm needs support after ruinous rains. Yeah. All right. Floods ruin Cook Farm's growing year. Yep. Um, and um, he writes, the chemical-free vegetable farm managed by partners Chelsea Mice and Dylan Cook is at the confluence of three creeks in Hayworth, located south of Bloomington. The broad watershed recently received 10 inches of rain in two days. 10 inches, folks. That's a lot of rain. It's a lot of water. Creating a six-foot wall of water that devastated the farm's crops. Our friends at Illinois Stewardship Alliance yesterday alerted us to the announcement that Cook Farm determined the damage is irreparable, and is closing down for the foreseeable future. We mm -hmm. will regroup and rebuild, and when we can, we will plant again, but it won't be quick, Chelsea and Dylan wrote in a message on their website uh, that we share verbatim below. We are also... Yeah, because they can't even... Uh, you're probably going to read this, but they can't even replant due to Yeah, that's what I, was, I, w I wanted to get to. By the way, yeah. let's show you what it looked like this is their tomato field. Um, and for those of you listening on the podcast, you can see the tops of the sticks. That's it. And there's a, they're in a boat. Um, and, they're kayaking uh, through their tomato fields. Is that a kayak? Okay, kayaking yeah. through the tomato field. Yeah. Just uh, uh, unbelievable. Um, they are also reluctantly asking for financial assistance to do cleanup and assess and remediate toxic pollution left by the floodwaters and help transition their employees until Cook Farm can get back to the business of producing healthy and delicious local food. Now, uh, you have that link, don't you, uh, Peggy? Are yeah, you I put it up and I put it in the, uh, in the so, feed here. So uh, we're sharing that, and we're hoping that some of you will be generous uh, and uh, help these folks out. Apparently, they have CSAs, um, people in uh, all over the state, and, and some in Chicago uh, get their CSA. Um, it says so. They're yeah. They're either refunding for the CSA, or if people will stick with them, they will credit it. Um, and they say our vegetable field lies at the confluence of three creeks in Hayworth and received. More than 10 inches of rain in less than two days. The creek's watersheds coming from Bloomington, Downs, and Hayworth all also received over 10 inches of rain. Our field didn't stand a chance. It was entirely covered in over six feet of floodwaters. While the water receded in a couple of days, it left behind a total loss. Our crops are dead, severely damaged, and in some cases completely missing. And unfortunately... We are unable to sell anything that did survive or plant again in a timely fashion due to recent rules passed regarding food safety. It should come as no surprise to anyone living in McLean County that our floodwaters are so toxic as to require a 30 to 180 day waiting period before replanting. Yeah. And wow. that is the FDA Food Safety Modernization Act is what they're referring to. And the fact that those waters can be that toxic there is just yeah. um, 
not surprising, but devastating to them. So um, they're going to get back on their feet, and uh, if you can help, you should. Um, I know it's just one farm, but not all the farms had six feet of water on their property and were completely wiped out. And I believe they have had the last three years, they've had it. Yeah. In 2019, they lost the summer and spring plantings when they were sprayed with herbicides by a neighboring farmer. In 2020, nice. they navigated running the small business through COVID and 2021 has brought them a flood. <sighs> oh boy. And, uh, it is not easy being a farmer as, uh, <laughs> many people, have uh, attested to uh, over the years, but uh, in this case, this is um, this is crazy stuff. So uh, we send our best to the folks at Cook Farm. If you feel it uh, in your heart to help, uh, you should uh, do, yeah. do what you can, and um, they will. If you know, they they will yeah. work it out with you. Thanks to Liz Moran Stelk and everyone at Illinois Stewardship Alliance and Bob Benenson as well, local food forum for bringing that to our attention. Yeah. So um, let's hope that things go well for them. All right. Now, now we come to good news, better news on the uh, Madi and Rose beat. Mm -hmm. uh, Madi and Rose, of course, being the piping plovers uh, on the shores of Lake Michigan at Montrose Beach and the... Uh, uh, the uh, the bird sanctuary there. Do um, um, you want to handle this, or do you want me to to go with this, Peggy? Um. Well, we can we can kind of both. Well, I've got talk the, about it. Uh, we had Bob Dolgan yeah. on the show last week to talk about what was going on there, and then I got the uh, my, uh, my newsletter from the Montrose Beach the Montrose Montrose Beach and students I volunteers. And, and I uh, got the Chicago Piping Plovers newsletter. Yeah. And uh, so they wrote uh, last Wednesday, uh, filmmaker Bob Dolgan was monitoring the plovers at the edge of the dunes when he observed Rose, who was on the nest incubating eggs, suddenly get up and run away carrying a piece of shell in her beak. The first chick had hatched. Over the next day, two more eggs hatched, and the tiny chicks began exploring their new home in the western pan. Um, this is the cool part. This is so interesting. The fourth egg did not hatch soon after, so the decision was made to transport it to Lincoln Park Zoo, yeah. where it was Because placed... they weren't incubating it any longer. That's, that's what triggered the decision. Ah, uh, and where it was placed in an incubator and closely monitored, Early this morning, we received the happy news that the egg hatched and the chick was deemed healthy enough to be returned to Montrose at approximately 9 a.m. It rejoined its family and was immediately accepted and brooded by its parents. Wow. That's a, that's a feel-good story right there, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, so there's four chicks now, again this year. That's three successful years so far. Of, yeah. of breeding here in, in um, Montrose. And as they said, now's the hard part. <laughs> yeah. You know, keeping yeah. track of the chicks because they're like the parents, they're running around, but they're really vulnerable. And um, and maybe, you know, maybe it's a good thing that the uh, much of the bird sanctuary is closed right now to keep folks uh, at a distance. But I saw a photograph of of uh, photographers lined up, you know, to get shots of. Yeah. Money, and and that is chicks. one thing. Some of the articles caution is even though people want to get really close with photos that can distract the birds that can, you know, they're not, they're trying to avoid the, the cameras and then the little ones start running around, etc. You know, yeah. be careful of where you're going, taking the photos, follow the, you know, Follow the barriers. Don't go up to the nest, obviously. Uh, I mean, that's simplifying it, but you get it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's, uh, that's, but that's a great story, and uh, I'm glad that they're doing well. I'm going to ask a question here because I want our viewers uh, and listeners to, to write in with their responses. I'm kind of curious, uh, and we'll get to this towards the end of this segment. Um, how are you tomatoes doing? Um, because... Uh, I, we posted on Instagram and Facebook yesterday 
our one ripe tomato that we've gotten so far. One, you know, about this size, and uh, uh, it's a garden gem, uh, which is uh, Dr. Harry Klee at the University of Florida who has bred those. Uh, we have other we have others growing. It seems to be an odd year for tomatoes, um, and um, I, I, we've got tomatoes on the vine, but they mm-hmm. seem smallish and behind. Usually, we have a ripe tomato before the end of June. Um, certainly the garden gems are usually pretty oh. early. They, they ripen pretty early. So, uh, uh, I'll ask you just very quickly. What about you, Peggy? Uh, I don't have a whole lot of tomatoes, cherry tomatoes. Okay. But I, I think, I yeah. think the heat, you know, all the heat, we had the super cold May mm-hmm. and then the blast of heat on the plants and drought. Yeah, so I think it's 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 slowing things down, uh, and we're getting responses here. So, uh, yeah. well, maybe we could just uh, go through. Uh, let's see. Um, Shelley says I have a lot of better boys, but they are big and green. Well, I'm glad yours are big and green. Mine are smallish so far. I I I I'm not exactly sure. Again, I think it was all the conditions that you you said, Peggy. Um, Amos says my tomatoes are still green. Lots of them, though. Um, Alexandra, tomato fruit is doing great. Nothing ripe yet, but I plant late. But having had a bad problem with aphids and white flies this year, mm-hmm. had to take out one plant. Aphids and white flies. I usually don't mm-hmm. see white flies until the end of the year. And then they're all on everything. I have to be yeah. careful about bringing my tropicals in because that's when the white flies are around. I don't usually see them earlier in, in the year. I, I've seen, oh, and I didn't. All right, I have to pop this photo up if I can um, of, and I don't even know if I sent it to myself. Um, <laughs> it's, I, t- I took a photo of, speaking of aphids, uh, a, a very interesting photo. Yep, here it is. All right, what I'm going to do, Peggy, is uh, have you uh, talk about the uh, the garden walk coming up, and while you're doing that, I'm going to see if I can get this loaded up there uh, so folks okay. can see it because it's a pretty cool photo. Yeah, yeah. So speaking of birds and bees and butterflies and insects, um, there's a native garden tour on July 24th, um, celebrating the year of the butterfly with the annual birds, bees, and butterflies garden walk coming from West Cook Wild Ones. Um, it's Saturday, July 24th from 1 to 5 p.m., and it's open to everybody. It's The tour goes to eight lovely color-filled gardens in Oak Park, River Forest, Forest Park, and Berwyn. Um, and it's West Cook Wild Ones members. It's $10, 15 for non-members, and kids are free. Uh, ticket holders are going to get a tour map for two days before the event. It can be biked or driven. You know, it's a self-guided tour with the map. And uh, it's a local effort to bring awareness about how to support healthy habitats for butterflies and other pollinators. And you can go to westcook.wildones.org to register. I will put that up in the chat here. Um, And again, it is July 24th from 1 to 5 p.m. Great way to see pollinator gardens and get some uh, inspiration and ideas for your own yard. All right. Good timing. I I got the the photo. This, to me, is... Too cool. Uh, speaking of aphids, all right. I went out in back uh, in my uh, in my alleyway, um, and I, there's a. Uh, we've talked about it on the show. My cup plants, of course, have escaped from my yard and are all over the mm, neighborhood. Taking it's, over the neighborhood, yes. Especially, <laughs> there's a line of them against the back fence of my neighbor's yard. Uh, but it's actually really cool because it's this beautiful. Right now, it's in bloom, um, and it's this row of cup plants. The only thing you yeah. need to be careful about is that they're sending seeds everywhere uh, when yeah. after they bloom. Could be worse. Yeah. Eh, they're worse. Sure. I've got some in my yard I still haven't could, ripped could out. Could be tree so. of heaven. Yeah. So uh, I was out there like I think taking my recycling out or something and I saw this and uh, I thought this was a very interesting photo uh, or, 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 or situation, because if you see all those bugs on the right are aphids. Mm-hmm. And of course, that is uh, 
um, a ladybird beetle or ladybug on the left. Um, and uh, it's an Asian ladybird. It's not the red one. It's the orange one. But still, um, it, if you ask me, the, <laughs> the aphids have no idea about what's about to hit them. Um, and I just thought, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, trouble looming around the corner. So, um, uh, I, 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 so I, I gotta, I gotta grab my camera. I gotta get this. I gotta get this photo. Uh, it's, it's, it's just too cool. So that's, uh, that's nature, uh, at work. At least it isn't, uh, another squash vine borer that's about yeah. to, t- to take out my, uh, <laughs> My okay, so this one needs music in the background, the Jaws music or something. So there you go. I thought uh, that was worth uh, mentioning on the show. So how are we doing? Let's see. Um, Let's see. We've got Deborah says, um, two tomato plants, one Roma, one beefsteak, a good number of flowers, some very small green tomatoes, but not many. Oh, you're way behind, Deb. Uh, sorry. Sorry to say well, a lot that. of it also, again, uh, and Deb, I think she's a container gardener, right? Um, I think so. Yeah, well, I've got um, uh, a combination in my yard because I have such a tiny yard mm-hmm. that yeah. uh, if I put all the tomatoes in the ground, I would be risking problems by putting them in the same place year after year. So yeah. I rotate in a place where I had a tomato in the ground before I'll put a container or I'll put something else. Mm-hmm. So last where I had my tomatoes last year, I have kale and beets and I had some spinach and some really unsuccessful, uh, broccolini or broccoli mm-hmm. rob, which I just could not get to germinate in the soil. We germinated inside and I've taken it out and still it's kind of, Hmm. It's kind of languishing. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, it's it's past the season for it, really. Uh, so I might try again in the fall. Uh, but then, uh, where I had last year, I had uh, some beets and other things in the ground. I put my tomatoes. So I've got some in the about half and half, half of them mm-hmm. in the ground, half of them in tomatoes. In fact, just the other day, I uh, top dressed the container tomatoes with compost. Went uh, digging into the compost pile and. Um, figured it was time for them to, to get a boost. I should probably yeah. do it more often. I probably should do it once a week, but there you go. No, um, once a month. I actually have third year kale doing quite nicely. Really? Okay. Yep. Yours is gone. For, well, but you, you, you overwintered I it. I hoop housed it. Yeah. You, yeah. You had a row cover. Um, I, which, I did the Nikki Jabor on it this year. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of doing that myself this year uh i, I want to see what we can get through and what and one of the things we did all right I, i've got a kale story for you and i don't know if i told <laughs> uh-oh. uh-oh first of all yeah this is a kale story here i don't know if you can see that i tried to cut my finger ow. off ow, ow, there it ow, is ow. it's actually looking pretty good right now okay yeah uh although you can see it's it's almost almost the whole finger i i, I tried to really wow do you, you did the number on that one for yeah, sure yeah really but um it's it's <laughs> yeah it was with pruners i was i was trimming kale and working and you're right it is those corona pruners we got they're little uh i call them deadheading pruners because they're little snippers um they're very sharp very sharp which i found out the hard way okay so i'm going through the kale and going to and i went Oh no! I didn't really want to do that. I don't do think that. that's what you said. <laughs> no, I didn't. Um, I was kind of freaked out. Uh, but it, uh, we cleaned it up real good and got some antiseptic on it and wrapped it up. And within a couple of days, um, it was fine. Um, and it, I'll have a scar <laughs> there. Wow. But I, but I didn't end up like Rahm Emanuel. That's the important thing. Okay, that is the important thing. Um, and uh, so the kale story, though, is about how we got our big crop of kale in the backyard over the winter we um we had our indoor farm here which we grow in mason jars with the happy leaf grow lights and um kathleen had planted a bunch of kale over the winter and uh at the end of the winter it was 
getting leggy and, and, and the stems were really thick and tough. Yeah, gnarly. And she said, well, do you think we could plant that outside? And I said, yeah, let's give it a shot. So she pulls it out and chops off a bunch of the roots. I slam it in the ground uh, early, early, early in the spring, uh, like a half a dozen plants. And, oh, my gosh, they took off. They just went nuts in the ground. In fact, I put those in, and there were – this is the, the interesting part of the story. There were a couple of the plants left over uh, mm -hmm. that – I, we pulled out of the jar and they had roots and I, and I put them on the side and kind of forgot about them. And then, um, I looked for them in a couple of days and couldn't find them. And I saw that they had gotten blown under a, another plant. So I grabbed those shoots and I went, Oh, you're looking pretty dead. Well, I said, well, I'll throw them in a pan of water. Okay. And <laughs> outside, I just threw them in a pan of water. I said, well, if you're going to survive, you're going to survive. So what happens? The, uh, we have a freeze, uh, a hard freeze, and the pan of water is frozen solid. And now I've got frozen kale in, in the water. I went, oh, okay. Well, then I brought it indoors to let it thaw, and then it warmed up outside. And I went, let's try to plant this. Let's, <laughs> let's see what happens. I planted it. Freeze-dried. Uh, Freeze-dried, and it's surviving. It thawed, and, it's, and I planted it, and those plants are rocking. And I'm thinking, how, how do you kill a kale plant? You, you really can't. Um, so it, it was just uh, amazing to me because it, it got desiccated. Then I threw it in water. Then it froze. And yet takes a licking and keeps on ticking. Um, so that's my, uh, my kale. Um, and Deborah, by the way, says, I'm never eating fingerling carrots at your house. Aha! Well, 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 no, no, I, I can find that. Thank you, Deb. Um, yeah. <laughs> so. Okay, Diana's hitting the puns too. Uh, Diana, kale survived. I thought so. Uh, thank you, Diana. Any more? Is it about more? time for uh, Uncle Ricky? Yeah, I think <laughs> we're getting pretty close to uh, to Uncle Ricky. What were we going to discuss? There was something we were going to discuss with Uncle Ricky, and that was, do you remember? Well, there's the whole Great Lakes article. Right. That's it. In the New York Times. That's right. And that's one of the things. If you didn't see. With Dan Egan. Dan Egan, who I'm trying to get back on the show. Okay. Dan Egan is a, an author and a writer. He did this article, article for the New York Times uh, this week, and uh, it's about Chicago. And uh, how we are, uh, uh, oh boy, I don't know if that makes sense, Robert. He says, kale if I know. Kale if I know. I guess that's how that works. Okay. Anyway, so uh, Dan Egan wrote this article. He was on our show, by the way, in 2017, talking about his book, The Death and Life of the Great Lakes. Uh, so he knows a lot about Great Lakes. And he wrote this amazing story this week, which to me, explained finally uh, more clearly than I've ever seen what the issue is with water in Chicago. And basically the issue is we're built on a swamp. Now I knew that, but he explained it in such detail about levels and, you know, backing water up the, its own level, yes. right. And reversing the flow of the Chicago river and then opening the gates into Lake Michigan when we have floods and where's the water. And when Lake come? Michigan is higher than the river. Right. So actually, I went on um, uh, Ben Jarofsky's show on Friday, which I believe gets released today. So you can hmm. go to the Ben Jarofsky show and hear me ranting. Uh, and he was asking me questions like I was the engineer, like I was Dan you, Egan, who wrote rant? the article. What? You rant? Yeah, a little bit. It, and some of it wasn't even about environmental stuff. Uh, but I feel, I, I feel like I, I, I get set free on, on uh, Ben's. <laughs> Ben Jarofsky show. Uh, ben Jarofsky yeah. show. So, uh, by the way, if you don't know, Ben Jarofsky is a longtime columnist for the Chicago Reader uh, and does his own podcast called The Ben Jarofsky Show. Uh, so uh, if you want to check that out, you can. In fact, uh, if, you, if you find that link, you can pop that up there, Peggy. Uh, so we were talking about that, and that's what we have to talk about with Mr. DeMaio today because it's if you haven't seen the article – Seek it out, unless uh, you could pop that up there too. If, if yeah, if, I, I did. 
the the problem is if you don't have a New York Times subscription, you might not be able to read it. Right. It is behind a paywall, um, but you might get away with one uh, if you're not a regular reader of the yeah. Times. They might give you a freebie. I don't know. Uh, I, because the other thing, it's got remarkable video in it. That's the cool thing about doing online stories like that now. You, not only photos, but videos that, that go with yeah, it. it. It's it's 3D, it's um, embedded video, it's just really a well done And you article. will understand better than you have before. Uh, you'll know exactly what the problem is uh, with uh, heavy rains and climate change in Chicago uh, because climate change in Chicago is climate change in the Midwest, which means more rains or and mm -hmm. well periods of drought uh exacerbated by periods of heavy downpours and um that's the story of last year when mm -hmm. they were trying to control the flooding on the chicago river is worth the price of admission so if you can read that article you should okay speaking of rick de uh i think it's time to get him on here so we'll take a quick break and be back with meteorologist rick de it's the mike novak show with peggy malecki you have the ability to give your soil a superpower. It's called composting. If you don't have a backyard, you need to contact Collected Resource Compost. CRC has diverted 7,000 tons of food scraps since 2010. They bring you a fresh 5-gallon bucket or a 32-gallon neighbor tote with each pickup. You fill it with organic matter from your kitchen, they swap it out and get it to a commercial composting operation. Fight climate change. Go to collectedresource.us. Once upon a time, in a place called Mzansi, the people love driving cars everywhere. They use lots and lots of electricity and chop down many trees for firewood. And then a very strange thing happened. The weather began to change. In some places there were droughts where before there was rain. In other places, the rivers flooded. The grown-ups realized they were contributing to the strange weather. They discovered if they used clean energy and less electricity, they could save Mzansi for their children. What happened then? How the story unfolds is up to each and every one of us. Switch off, recycle, change. Help save tomorrow, today. Whether you're a farmer or a backyard gardener, assist your soil in providing key nutrients to your plants with Spectrum Soil Inoculum from Tinyo Biologicals. The beneficial microorganisms in Spectrum break down and release vital nutrients and make them more accessible to your plants. Spectrum works with nature to decompose organic matter into humus, building richer, healthier soil. Spectrum is approved for use on certified organic crops and is OMRI listed. Get Spectrum at blazing-star.com. Welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki, and there he is, meteorologist Rick yep. DeMaio. Good morning on, a, as I mentioned earlier, kind of a gloomy day, isn't it, Rick? Yeah, we'll, we'll call this, um, instead of July, we'll call it Drooly, July. <laughs> okay. Uh, do we start? Uh, the, 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 clouds, the, clouds the clouds are drooling on us, right? Uh, well, that's, that's that's pleasant. Yeah. Okay. And I'm I'm emailing <laughs> some stuff right now, Mike. All I'm emailing you some drought images and stuff. What did uh, yeah. you did you just send some? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. So I'll I'll be yeah. I mean, I, I sent you guys a bunch of stuff a few days ago, which I'm sure you have, but I just sent you some new stuff that I was looking at this morning. Yeah, I've got some stuff from uh, a, a few days ago here yeah, too. This is the at, brand new Facebook. stuff. Um. All right. Well, I'll take a look at this and not much different. Not much different. Uh, all right. Well, I've I've got the. Uh, let me just see what we've got here. Oh yeah. Okay. It's, it's a little bit different. It's yeah. It's relating more so to the um, to the heat out west, Las Vegas, uh, tied their all time record high of 117. Wow. Um, Death Valley uh, tied their all time high record of 130, uh, but their overnight low temperature was only 104. Um, and it is now being looked at as because they had an overnight low of 104 and an afternoon high of 130, the average temperature for the day is going to end up being the warmest 24-hour average that we've ever seen. Um, 
in North America. And these records go back all the way, I think, to the 1870s. And that's that's pretty impressive stuff. Wow. So even though we didn't break the afternoon high, uh, the average high temperature is going to be the warmest ever. And again, uh, the heat wave, uh, this is now the third one. Remember, the first one occurred um, in early June in the desert southwest, moved up in the Pacific Northwest. And because we are still under, you know, such extreme drought conditions, um, every heat wave seems to get a little bit more uh, modified. Wow. Uh, you know, you sent us actually a really interesting story this week. Uh, I don't know if you know the guy personally, the one who wrote uh, about the hottest temperature ever on Earth um, and how he takes issue with some of uh, the measurements that were made uh, and what, you know, what is really the hottest temperature ever recorded on Earth. I thought that was a fascinating article. Yeah, I think you're talking about Jeff Masters. Yes, Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeff Masters um, started out as a, a hurricane hunter. Um, he is a graduate from University of Michigan. Created Weather Underground. Go blue. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, then he um, was doing some work for uh, the Weather Channel, which was also you know connected with Weather Underground. Then he left, and now he's working with uh, Yale University, which they have a fantastic. Um, department on climate change, but it's more so on kind of like like a social um, aspect of climate change. Matter of fact, the Yale University Climate Connection and the Yale University um, Climate Opinion Poll, I think I've showed that to you guys before, mm -hmm. um, is one of the most, I think, comprehensive ways of understanding how to ask questions about climate, how to, you know, how to kind of parcel through you know, the answers um, and then the responses. So Jeff always kind of takes a second and maybe a third look at, you know, how we, like I was just, I was just watching Meet the Press and Chuck mm -hmm. Todd was talking about how, you know, politicians need to start acting on our changing climate. And he mentioned that we just had Tropical Storm Elsa. And I was like waiting for him to say it. And sure enough, he did. He said, this was the earliest ever that we've had um, a letter E, which is not right. It's not the earliest ever. It's the earliest in recorded history. All right. Now, how is that different from ever? Ever means that you can go all the way back maybe, what, a thousand years ago or maybe, you know, 140 years ago. But you can't. You can only go back to the 1950s when we really started to look for tropical storms either from uh, you know, uh, you know, Air Force and Army and Navy missions. Um, and then you have to look at the satellite era, which didn't start until 1960. So you got to be really careful about how you say ever and how you say recorded history and how you do these records. So Jeff mm -hmm. Masters is challenging some of these past records based on, you know, where the thermometer was. Was it calibrated recently? Um, is it in the same area that the other thermometers were? Um, I still remember, Mike, back in 1988, and I think, Peg, you were here, we had some of the most incredibly um, hot temperatures in the Midwest, but routinely, mm -hmm. O'Hare was always like a degree or two warmer than anybody else. And everybody in the meteorological community outside of the Weather Service kept saying that the placement of the thermometer was too close to some of the runways at the airport, so you were getting some additional heat either from the runway itself or maybe from the airplanes. And we kept saying that that they need to go out and recalibrate the thermometer, just like up at Pawaukee. Pawaukee's temperature is always two degrees warmer than everybody else. And I've been up there a couple of times and I've told them, I'm like, you guys need to like either move your, your ASOS equipment, that's the Automated Surface Observation System, or recalibrate your temperature. And the guy's like, oh, I never noticed that. So <laughs> the bottom line is when you get, when you get this close to breaking a record, um, and that, that goes even into like an F4 and F5 tornado, you have to make sure that you're doing everything from a standpoint of making it scientifically accurate so that there's no kind of kinks in the armor if someone wants to challenge it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Speaking of uh, some of those uh, temperatures, this uh, I, I wish it were a little easier to read here, but you sent us this map, and they're all pretty much triple digits in all of those states. It's just uh, crazy. Um, and, and not only triple digits, but triple digits almost above 110. Um, Grand Junction, Colorado, just broke just broke their all time high temperature. Um, wow. The heat the heat's a little bit further west of Phoenix because there's a fairly large area of low pressure um, over southern Texas with a lot of clouds. Um, they're getting a lot of rain, and in what I forget exactly what they call that area down by Galveston. There's a certain name for that southern coast of Texas. Um, anyway. Uh, but that area, and, and, and if you look at a satellite view of Mexico itself, it's been very cloudy. It's been very wet. So what I think is going on is you're getting this, this dome of thunderstorms that are kind of pushing up on the atmosphere over areas of Mexico and South Texas and even eastern New Mexico. I was talking to some students um, in my online class that are down in Albuquerque, and that's because Lewis University has a satellite campus down in Albuquerque. And I keep asking them, I go, how is the weather down there? They go, oh, it's been great. It's been cloudy. We've been getting our monsoon rains. So eastern New Mexico is getting their monsoon rains, and some of that moisture is getting into southeast Arizona. So what happens is you almost generally tend to get uh, – yeah, there you go, the, the soil moisture. What you generally tend to get is the atmosphere gets pushed upwards with all the, uh, with all the um, convection. And you want to get, end up getting the sinking motion on the western side and on the eastern side. So when you get that sinking motion on the western side, like you're getting over western Arizona, Nevada, and California, it enhances the ability for the atmosphere to stay sunny and also get hot. But what's really interesting about that map, Mike, is that the areas that still are, are dry um, really dried out in the last uh, week. I just looked at this map not too long ago, and it shows the amount of evaporation just in the last seven days. If you think about it, since the 1st of July, we have not had a lot of rain around here. It's been really, really dry. Uh, and the only thing that's kind of saved us from evaporating more is it hasn't been too hot and it hasn't been too sunny. And I think I mentioned that in my, in my report last week was that we were heading into somewhat of a cooler pattern, a little bit cloudier. And even if we do get dry, you're not going to notice it as much. But if you try to put a golf tee into the ground on a golf course right now, uh, you're having a little bit more difficulty than you did about a week ago. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't played golf in a while, so uh, I don't. Let me uh, pop up the, the drought map. This is uh, uh, from the West. Um, oh, my God. This is unbelievable. Yeah. And, and what's really amazing, and I wish I would have sent this to you, but um, there's now – more areas of California in the D3 and D4 than we've ever seen up to this point. And when you start to see something like that, and it's only the 8th of July, uh, this is not good news. In fact, I was just emailing uh, Nancy Liu, who works for WGN and News Nation, because I used to work with her at Fox, local, <laughs> and she's now, she's now the Western U.S. correspondent. And she was doing a couple of reports, and um, and I didn't watch News Nation, but I, I saw her report on Facebook, and right away I thought to myself, eh, she needs a little bit of help with this. So I sent her a couple of really interesting <laughs> links to, that's what I do. I know, uh, you, you, whether it's New York Times, <laughs> New York Times. or CNN or whatever, you're just sending them, uh, they just need a little help, a little DeMaio help here. <laughs> yeah, I haven't heard from Bill Maher yet. I'm still I'm still waiting to hear from him. Um, but I but I guarantee I won't challenge Neil deGrasse Tyson. He knows it all. Okay. Good. Um, but by the way, I'm going to see Bill Maher up in Milwaukee in August, and Neil deGrasse Tyson when he comes here to Chicago in September. But nonetheless, yeah, if but you Bill look Maher at, may not let you in the door. <laughs> I'll, I'll promise not to tell him who I am. Okay? Um, but, but, but you know, you know, Bill Maher is actually he he was the first one to really start talking about the crisis with water and almonds uh, almost a month ago, yeah. and now it's become big news not only in the New York Times but the Wall Street Journal, um, and yeah. and he was on to this. But, but getting back to the drought in California, there is a major wildfire that is ongoing now across the western um, – I think it's like just west of the Reno 
uh, Lake Tahoe area. And I haven't looked at it today, but the reason why they're now getting wildfires is that same area of, there you go. Oh, I'm Mike. That's fantastic. Um, you can see, see the area. If you go directly north of Lake Tahoe, you can see the way that that smoke is developing. That's a, that's a great satellite loop. So, and you, what's really interesting is, is you notice how the smoke is developing over the area that's dark underneath. So what the visible satellite is doing is it's not only showing you the smoke, but the darkness is the forest. So because the forest is dark, you can actually see exactly where um, the fire is. Uh, so you're not going to see fire in like Nevada where there's no woods. But what's interesting about this particular fire, um, it started to develop after a couple of those little cumulus clouds and cumulonimbus clouds moved over that area. And it's now thought that there's a couple of lightning strikes that came out of those. And right now, the concern is that this moisture is going to be moving around that weak upper lobe, and all you need is a couple of big thunderstorms in Southern California, and you got lightning, and then, of course, you have wildfires. So this is, this is not good for California. The next week or two are going to be really, really critical for them. I want to point out something that looks so tantalizing. If you look to the left side and all those clouds... Uh, along the coast, you 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 want to think wh why why can't they just come inland and cause uh, and, <laughs> and, and bring bring some relief, you know? Yeah, it, it's called the it's called the um, the coastal range. But Mike, real quickly, if if you go way north, right in the middle of the state, about maybe an inch and a half south of the Oregon line, yeah, there's a big mountain. Do you know what that mountain is? Um, it, looks, it almost looks. Like yeah, Mount Shasta. Mount Shasta. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Typically, typically that mountain is completely covered with snow. If you look at webcam images of Mount Shasta, Northern California, yeah. there's almost zero snow. This wow. is this wow. is terrible. This is terrible. Two reasons why it's bad. A, you have more forest that is now, um, if you want to call it, vulnerable for wildfires. But the second part, which I think is more uh, of a concern from an ecosystem standpoint, the less snow you have beginning in July and August, the less snow then melts and the less water you have going down into the rivers and the streams. And it totally affects the ecosystem when you get into late July, August, early September. So now your ecosystem is now running on a stream that 10 years ago was 10 feet wide. Now it's six feet wide. By the time you get to Early August, it's four feet wide. By the time you get to uh, maybe early September, it's maybe two feet wide. What wow. ends up happening is the animals are now looking for places to drink and looking for, you know, little munchies to nibble on. And now they have to go to different places as well. And this gets animals angry. So what ends up happening is you're now changing not only the hydrosphere, but you're also changing the biosphere in the ecosphere at the same time, because all of these are related. And as soon as you start to change the ability for animals to sustain themselves off of water from melting glaciers, now you have animals going into people's backyards, you have mm -hmm. animals that are angry. Um, it totally changes what we call the urban wildlife interface, which is a new term that we had to develop because it's not that the animals are coming into our backyards, like people say, we're moving into the animals' backyards. And when you change yeah. the climate, the ecosystem, and the behavior of the animals as well, it's not good. Um, very quickly, because I want to get to the Midwest, uh, there is uh, another heat dome forming uh, in the West right now, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. This is the one that, that we were just talking about, the one that is, is out there. And I love the, the fact that we now call them heat domes, like polar vortex is one's a vortex, One's a dome, uh, but the heat dome um, is there. It's not going to go away. But if you think about it, every time that the heat dome has expanded or intensified, what has our weather done here in the Midwest, temperature-wise? It's, it's gotten it, cool. It, it gets cooler, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's gotten cooler, And right? rainier. And, and rainier, but more so, Peg, if you look to areas to the south, the right. what's called the baroclinic zone has shifted south a little bit. And areas what, of like seriously, what what is it? The barrel what? 
it's called the baroclinic zone. So the baroclinic zone is basically an area where the temperature lines get compressed. So as they get compressed, you begin to move the winds across them much more quickly. You begin to develop vertical motion. If there's moisture, you get thunderstorms. And because the air is coming in from the north and west around that heat dome, areas from, say, South Dakota, Nebraska, southern Missouri, or southern Iowa, and then the Missouri get big thunderstorms. In fact, for the last 30 days, they've averaged 10 to 15 inches of rain along that south end of that, quote, baroclinic zone. So wow. central Missouri into southern Illinois have had 10 to 15 inch inches of rain since June 1st, which is phenomenal. Well, now, you know, we, we talked about it in our previous segment about this farm, Cook Farm, uh, downstate Illinois. They got 10 inches of rain. They had six feet of oh, water yeah. in their fields. Yeah. Yeah. And, and now what's happening is there's concern that once we get into the next week or two, um, if there's too much rain in areas of southern Iowa and central Illinois, that could propose, that, that could uh, initiate flooding. Um, and then obviously areas of northern Iowa, which are still um, only about 20 percent of moisture available, you're going to have areas developing in the Midwest the next couple of weeks of too much rain and not enough rain. Well, However, the pattern does, yeah, there you go. So most of Iowa, which again, we've talked about this before, they're the number one uh, state in the United States for corn. Uh, 1.6 billion bushels. Uh, Illinois is right behind at about 1.5 percentage wise. Iowa is 16%, Illinois is 15%. And I still look at that little, that little red part up across McHenry and Lake County and Walworth and Kenosha County or Racine County, and it's so small. It really is. And I was up there last week and the core looks great. So I still think they're overdoing the extreme diet. I really do. However, that area of southern Minnesota, which is number um, three, no, the number four in the country for corn, there's a lot of corn in Minnesota. That's the part that doesn't look like it's going to get um, any rapid help soon. But over the next week to 10 days, the pattern does become a little bit wetter. And the wetness seems to expand a little bit. So I don't think this is something that's going to be as serious as 1988 or 2005 or 2012. I think it's just a matter of time before the rain kind of expands a little bit further north. Uh, but as we head into what's called the germination um, uh, portion of the corn, um, we may be getting a little bit, you know, a little bit dicey with some of the dryness across um, areas mm -hmm. of Iowa. And but yet... Uh, from Missouri, say, into, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, from from Missouri into Illinois, as you had mentioned before, and Indiana, uh, it's about as green as as wet as we've seen it since last year. <laughs> we had record rainfall um, in the month or in the in the springtime. Yeah, and 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 the only place that really has changed here is Lower Michigan. That is now yeah. out of drought, yeah. and, they, and they got hammered last week. Oh uh, yeah. And it was last week and the preceding two weeks as well. That's why it's it's just really weird. It's like that one little spot. I'm I'm sure I'm still not sure how they're calculating that. Uh, but yeah, these are the maps. This was the latest drought map, um, and it's just it's really strange. Rockford has been kind of taken out of it a little bit. Um, I think Waukegan is actually just south of where that red is. So. Um, I don't know. They must have a couple of cooperative observer sites right in that area yeah. that, you know, have not gotten the rain. But um, the good news is but that so, it's, it's so much of that area, though, is and as all these rains are coming through and hitting the city in northern Cook are just not hitting the state line. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right about that, Peg. It's amazing how unlucky we've been. And even some of the heavy rains that we got, like kind of clipped western McHenry County and they all kind of moved you know, from the west, northwest to the east, southeast. But we have not had one of those nice east-west fronts. Even even like Milwaukee and Madison have had decent rains, but that one little area um, still getting kind of uh, still getting kind of um, shafted. I was in the lake yesterday and the day before, and the lake water temperature is up to 68 degrees. Uh, but still, on Thursday... That's like that a sauna. High, <laughs> yeah, it could be a little warmer. But yeah, on Thursday, we had a high of 68 degrees, um, the chances of getting 68 degrees in the month of July around here is about a 2% chance. And the last time we did that was 2015. Um, we may do that again today. So it'll be interesting to see if we get 
two 60 degree days in a matter of a four day period here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are we looking at here? Oh, this is just the, the rain that, that's been coming through. Obviously, it's a static image, but if it was in motion, you would actually see, and those people watching at home, uh, they're looking at their you know, radars on their phones. The rain is actually coming in from the east and moving west, all right? So there's a big area of low pressure um, that's literally centered between Peoria and Springfield, and the rain is literally rotating around the front side of that. And if you're saying that's kind of abnormal for July, you're right. But yeah. what happened also is our weather this week, um, and if you remember, we also had a tropical storm move into Mississippi uh, early mm -hmm. in the month of June. It was small, but the remnants went up along the East Coast the same time we were warm out West. Every time you bring a tropical storm into the Southeast United States, it warms the atmosphere. So we actually had, even though Elsa is a you know, you think of it as an area of low pressure. It's cloudy, it's rainy, but it brings a dome of tropical warmth. So we actually had warmth on the West Coast and then warmth on the East Coast with Elsa. And in between, you had that divot, which is why we're in this pattern right now. But Elsa, if you go back and look at where Elsa developed, it literally developed about 2,000 miles east of the Bahamas, like 10 days ago. And the fact that that storm held together only became a hurricane, as I like to call it, for like a cup of coffee. It did it twice, but it did it east of the Bahamas, and it did it right off the coast of Tampa for about two hours. The fact that that thing held together, it just shows you sometimes how these tropical storms kind of have like a mind of their own. And then once that thing moved up over uh, the coast of South Carolina and got a little bit of the warmth from the Gulf of Mexico, not the Gulf of Mexico, the, uh, the Gulf Stream, which right now is 85 degrees. That's phenomenally warm for early July. The Gulf Stream off the coast of South Carolina is 85 degrees, really, really warm. And that flatness of the Carolinas all of a sudden recreated, or not recreated, but um, provided the environment for Elsa to literally become a more intense tropical storm because it was kind of weak <laughs> when it made it through northern Florida. But there were wind gusts of 70 miles an hour from southern New Jersey up into northern New Jersey as that storm basically gathered strength overnight. And two different things happened. You had big storms that developed the day before across um, northern New Jersey. And I'm sure you guys saw some of the flooding in New York City. That flooding that occurred on Thursday where the FDR drive and the major Deegan, those are two highways that run along the East River, they did not flood because of the wind from Elsa. They flooded because you had a seven foot high tide because we're in a new moon right now. So that area of the Western uh, section of Long Island Sound, we, did, we saw it with Sandy as well. When you have winds coming in from the Northeast and you literally take the Long Island Sound and you raise it up seven feet, and then you put four or five inches of rain on top of it, and you still have a highway like the FDR Drive, which is right on the East River, built back in the 1930s, flood for like the fourth time in 20 years. As an urban planner and with a, with a, a bill going through Congress that says infrastructure on it, don't you think that you should start thinking about, hmm, we just flooded – the most populated city in the United States with five inches of rain and a weak tropical storm. Don't you think we should be doing something about it for maybe a category one storm or a category two? Yeah, I think we should. So all of these Mike and Peg are checks to go. We don't need this to happen again and shame on the weather casters in New York city for not connecting these dots more so. Mm. Doesn't say that they're not in like their blogs and their posts, but you need to be able to get out there on TV and say the high tide of seven feet, the four or five inches of rain from tropical Elsa and the FDR drive flooding again. Do you people want to continue to live in an environment like this? And you, you know that most people will say, no, I don't want to. Then we need to do something about it. Yeah. And the other place that happened was my hometown, Detroit where they have many of their freeways are below grade and they just flooded right. and there was nowhere for the water to go. Not, nothing they yeah. could do about it. Yeah, they got like eight or nine inches of rain. 
Yeah, yeah it, it was it was unbelievable. So again, I mean, these are things. I mean, I, I heard Chuck Todd talking about this, but I'm looking at this. I'm like going, dude, I could have sent you three or four maps. You could have expanded your segment by 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 two and a half minutes and really driven the point home. We got to get you on and, Chuck Todd. That's what we got to do. We got to get you on Meet the Press. Um, but, but it was like it was like they were afraid to talk about it. Don't be afraid to talk about it. It's right there in front of you. Well, talk I've, about. It. I know, and I'm reading more than one story that came out this week where people are saying this is absolutely climate change, and we got to stop yeah. dance, dancing around it. Look, when you when you put these all these things together, it says climate change on it, and so stop pretending that it's not, or it might be just weather, or you know whatever. But when you and, have, and, and, and you don't have to get you don't have to get like political and go. Oh, but I don't want to do something that's going to hurt the economy. Okay, you mean the economic shutdown that you just had yesterday because the FDR drive was closed and people couldn't get to work? How is that not the economy? Yeah. <laughs> the economy is not always something that's happening in the future. The economy is something that happened the last two days. All right? right? If you're not adapting and mitigating... Right, Peg, you're right. If you're not adapting and mitigating to having something that keeps flooding rains out of roads that keeps people from getting to work. You're not thinking clearly on this. It's, yeah. it's, it's as clear as night and day. Yep. All right. We need to have a forecast. All right. So uh, cloudy sixties today, a little bit of light rain coming through. I still think we're going to be in like the mid seventies during the day tomorrow. Um, and then eventually this thing weakens and we get into a much more humid air mass Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, with temperatures probably in the mid to upper 70s. But there's a couple of little ripples that come through that could produce a half an inch of rain here, a half an inch of rain there. I hope it hits Northern Lake in Northern McHenry County. Uh, but there is a pretty good chance of an inch and a half to two inches of rain over the next three days, which is good news. Nothing real hot, nothing real humid. Uh, but nothing in a way of any sunshine. I mean, we're going to be kind of cloudy for the next four days. Very unusual for the month of July, especially when we're getting into the hottest time of the year when our average high is 85. Mm -hmm. And when you get 68 for an average for an afternoon high temperature, it's kind of refreshing, but it's like, wow, that's climate variability. So we're in this we're in a little nugget of cooler air that's right over us that it doesn't look like it's going to really move out anytime soon. And as long as the heat dome stays out west, we get into this northwesterly flow. So uh, temperatures 5 to 8 degrees below normal, rainfall above normal, which is good. Um, so if you're a gardener, this is good news. And um, if you're a sun lover, it's not good news. Unless you're looking for heat for some of your plants uh, to ripen. So... All right, uh, Rick. Thanks, man. That was that was great. Great explanation, and and we don't even have time to talk about that terrific article by Dan Egan about Chicago and Lake Michigan. But well, maybe we'll get to that. We're going to get him on the show. Uh, I I contacted him, and he's going to be on the show. I think within the next few weeks. So uh, uh, and, we can talk about quickly, it. And real quickly, I think I think this Wednesday there's a public forum on that idiotic thing that Evanson is doing about saying that you don't have any. Any flowers on their parkways? Oh, are you kidding me? Don't oh, and, and Mike, forgot I about that. that. Mike, yeah, Mike and Peg. I hope you have someone who can explain to me that having hostas around the around a tree keeps the tree from getting the uh, the rainfall that it needs when the roots go like way out. Um, I don't. I don't get that. You know trees better than the city of Evanston, obviously. So uh, okay, yeah. You know what? We'll talk about th that too. I want to dig into that one and, and see what's happening because it just sounds like they're trying to copy Chicago in a really, really bad way. So, all right, uh, Rick, have a, have a great week. We'll, we'll talk to you next time. See you, guys. See you Rick. Guys. All right. Uh, yeah. City of Evanston. Um, what, what are you doing? Huh? What, what the, uh, yeah, what we got to look into it more than that one article, but yeah. Yeah. And we'll see what happens. All right. Uh, I want to thank, oh boy, what a great show. This was so much fun. Uh, Doug Terran from uh, Peggy Notabart Nature Museum. Uh, talking butterfly about, whiskey. And, and if you just tuned in now, you got to go back and see. Go go to the YouTube and, and take a look at the whole thing. Uh, Rick DeMaio, uh, as, as usual, with a, a brilliant observations about climate and weather. 
I want to thank Kathleen and Legata hiding upstairs. Kathleen's not hiding, but Legata is. And Basil the dog. And uh, and all you, of our listeners who's been offering such great comments this morning. Yeah, really, you guys, uh, we, we really, really appreciate that. Until next time, go green or... Go home. Uh, Stadler? Yeah, what? Is that it? Yes, it's over. How'd you like it? I don't know. I slept through the whole thing. Well, you didn't miss much. Ha <laughs>